Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, New Pathways for Recovery of Function Following Paralysis, presented by our keynote speaker, Dr. Reggie Edgerton. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars, advancing scientific collaboration and learning. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located in the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window. Or you may use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Reggie Edgerton. Dr. Edgerton received his PhD in exercise physiology from Michigan State University, a master's from University of Iowa and BS from East Carolina University. He is currently the director of the Neuromuscular Research Laboratory and a distinguished professor of the Departments of Integrative Biology and Physiology, Neurobiology, and Neurosurgery. He has been teaching and conducting research at UCLA for over 40 years. His research is focused on how the neural networks in the lumbar spinal cord of mammals, including humans, regain control of standing, stepping, and voluntary control of fine movement after paralysis, and how these can motor function be modified by chronically imposing activity-dependent interventions after spinal cord injury. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Reggie Edgerton. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Good morning. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to present a lecture to you at this uh, uh, virtual symposium uh, that is uh, being organized by Lab Roots. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the newer findings related to the possibility of recovering from paralysis. The title of the talk, New Pathways to Recover Function After Paralysis. First of all, I'd like to inform you that I have a conflict of interest because some of the work that we're doing is requiring us to develop technologies and I'm part owner of a company that's developing the technology so that we can take advantage of some of the findings that we have reported. <coughs> In this slide, you will see an animal that is stepping on a treadmill. This animal is completely paralyzed without the interventions that we have been developing. And they, this animal, even though there's no input from the brain, this animal can step forward, can step backwards, and as you see in the third video to the right, you'll see the animal actually gradually adjusting the step, stepping so that uh, the animal can step sideways. So this is all occurring without any input from the brain. So what I would like for you to think about is to what extent can this level of automoticity that's built into the spinal circuitry that is controlling this movement, to what extent would that be possible to happen in human subjects? So what I'm going to talk about in this lecture is the progress that has been made, not only in our laboratory, but in other laboratories that suggests that there's considerable potential in the human spinal cord and the whole nervous system of the human that will enable us to take advantage of a considerable amount of this automoticity. And I will also try to tell you 
to what degree we have some idea of how this is possible. So the automaticity is a key concept here. And the question that I'd like for you to think about is where does this automaticity come from? This automaticity uh, comes from, uh, to a major extent, from the spinal networks. The spinal networks alone have remarkable capability to process information. Now this particular slide is to illustrate why and how we've come to recognize some of these uh, uh, phenomenon in the, in the spinal cord. And it's largely because many of the, uh, the uh, strategies for control in movement uh, have been derived and developed actually over millions of years through evolution. So the same processes of neural control of movement that's present in fish, birds, amphibians, mammals, to a large extent, are very similar. Now, I'd also like to point out that as a result of this evolutionary conservation of the neural control mechanism, the person on the lower right, Stan Grillner, has been one of the leaders in this area. He is at, uh, at the Karolinska Institute. The person down on the lower left is one of the first individuals to show that these levels of automaticity are also present uh, in mammals. Now let's take a larger look at where is the control of movement? Where does it occur? Of course, if there's the individual is uninjured, then uh, you have all of your nervous system to help you to make all the movements that you do. Uh, that is, you have the brain, you have the neural circuitry within the spinal cord, and you have the muscles that can actually generate the movement itself. An injury can be at multiple levels along the spinal cord, but off most of the injuries of the spinal cord, they will result in no information or some information coming from the brain to the spinal circuitry. If there's no information from the brain, the question here is to what extent, how much automaticity can we take advantage of uh, from the spinal cord and from the muscle itself. So our emphasis has been in this control system that's within the spinal cord. Now you can get some movement by going directly to the muscles. We know that we can put electrodes in the muscles, directly stimulate, and that's a technique that's common, and that's uh, referred to as functional electrical stimulation. However, by st going directly to the muscle, you're completely bypassing the very sophisticated control systems that are in the spinal cord. And that's where our focus ha has been. <coughs> Again, going along the same concept, I'd like for you to think about the nervous system consisting of the brain and the spinal cord and networks throughout the brain and the spinal cord, all highly interconnected. So basically, we should be thinking of the fact that the spinal cord functions as part of the brain. It can do almost uh, a, a very large number of the functions that occur in the brain can also occur uh, in, in the spinal cord. And again, that's the source of the automaticity that we're trying to see to what extent we can take advantage in human subjects with complete paralysis. Now, to give you an idea of how some of these ideas ideas have evolved over time. It's not been an overnight uh, 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 recognition that some of these things that I'm going to show you is possible. It's actually, uh, this work has uh, again occurred in multiple laboratories all over the world and has been going on for decades. But one of the key things again is to what extent can we take advantage of the automaticity that's built into the spinal circuitry. Now, one of the uh, concepts and the phenomenon that has been known for, for many years is the idea of central pattern generation. And that is uh, that these uh, networks within the spinal cord can generate rhythmic activity without any input from the brain or actually without any input from the sensory system. But here you see sensory system and CPGs are uh, projecting to the automaticity. But this is really just part of the sources of the automaticity, but they're two very important sources, as you will see as we move forward. The other important finding that we found over time is that the spinal circuitry can learn. So many of the mechanisms that, is, that are used in the, uh, in the brain itself to learn uh, different uh, uh, events 
uh, this learning can also occur in the spinal cord, and therefore that enables us to use training and rehabilitation and physical therapy as another tool to take advantage of this automaticity. So the spinal learning is very important, and we'll see some evidence of that. Now, as we went further, we also recognized the importance of this concept of neuromodulation. Neuromodulation is where we can use an, a number of different interventions to change the physiological state, the functional state of the spinal cord. Uh, your brain uh, physiological state and the spinal cord changes continuously, but we can change it so that it is more likely to be able to stand or step, particularly after paralysis. So the idea of neuromodulation is, is also important because when we stimulate, we're not actually inducing the movement. You see enabling versus inducing. We change the physiological state so this circuitry can now stand and step and generate voluntary activity. We enable it to do it. We don't induce it to do that. So, uh, and the importance of the sensory system is, is, is great because you just saw an example of spinal rats that can, can perform rather complex movements. Now, the other thing in the human, as we progress to some of the human experiments, what we found is a little unexpected, is that the ability to control movement voluntarily, that is, the, after a, uh, a clinically complete, motor complete spinal cord injury, individuals have been able to regain connectivity from the brain to the spinal cord. And regaining this connectivity was a big surprise to us, but now looking back on it, uh, we, we think we might have a handle on how this, how this is happening. And then the other thing that is happening during the chronic treatment of these individuals that are completely paralyzed, completely paralyzed for more than a year, uh, that uh, there are changes in the autonomic system. The autonomic system is a part of the central nervous system that controls things like blood pressure, blood flow, bladder function, bowel function, sexual function, all of these systems that we never think about having to control because it, it's done automatically. And this is referred to as the autonomic nervous system. Now, where is this occurring? This is a longitudinal cross-section of a spinal cord, <coughs> of a cat, actually. And you see circled in red uh, the neurons, the interneurons in the middle, and coming from the top, the dorsum of the spinal cord, sensory information is coming in and being projecting to these interneurons. And these interneurons are the ones that's performing this amazing, complicated uh, interpretation of the sensory information coming that's helping the, in helping the animals, what you've seen so far, to step and to stand and perform the voluntary activity. So this is a, a key area that we need to know a lot more about exactly who and how these interneurons are doing this. So again, going back to the idea, we, almost all of our movements are made automatically. You don't have to think about the details of which muscles you're activating to perform a given movement. So my, my, hand, my hands are flailing around. I have no idea how, which motor pools I'm activating. It's just a combination of muscles that, is, that are activated that's defining the movement. And this, again, is done relatively automatic as a result of taking advantage of all the sensory input to the spinal cord. All of our sensory systems lead to the motor system, and therefore uh, we have different sources of control. Now, uh, uh, just to carry further on this automaticity, uh, start, this, uh, start this slide. Okay, so what you saw, when the point that I want to make out of this is in this structure, 
uh, there's a very simple signal that turns this uh, uh, this structure from a sitting to a standing position. There's a bench in front of it, and if you sit on this bench, this structure will begin to stand up. The point is a very simple signal with a relatively complex structure that's attached to this signal can generate complicated movements. So th again, this is another basic idea that uh, we need to keep in mind in trying to understand how this is uh, working. So. Now, getting back to what is, uh, more specifically, what is central pattern generation? Central pattern generation is demonstrated here. This is the output from uh, nerves going to flexor and extensor muscles, but on the top channel you see the output from a single interneuron. And this interneuron is active at the same time during the, quote, step cycle, during what's referred to as fictive locomotion, because there's really no movement but there's alternating activation of the nerves that's going to these different muscles. This can go on for hours just by placing a, a given combination, uh, the appropriate combination of pharmacological agents will induce this rhythmic activity. And without any sensory information and without uh, any information from the brain. So the central pattern generators, the networks that have the intrinsic capability to oscillate in flexor and extensor-like patterns, without phasic input from the brain or peripheral afferents. Now, <coughs> okay, where does this leave us in terms of the automoticity? The automoticity, yes, some is built into the central pattern generator, but if you look over to the left, you see the first circle represents the circuitry within the spinal cord, and then you have input from the brain from the top and sensory information uh, fr just uh, feeding in from the right, and the combination of those sources, the central pattern generator, the brain, and the sensory information is behind all of this control of the movement normally. Now, if you eliminate input from the brain, as shown in the middle, and you also eliminate the sensory information, this system can generate central pattern generation and, uh, and oscillate, as I've already shown you. But if you look to the far right, you see if you eliminate information from the brain, but you preserve the sensory information coming from proprioception and uh, skin, uh, then this system can perform many types of activities. Not only can it oscillate, but it can step with uh, full weight bearing. It can adjust the loading speed. Uh, it can adjust the mechanical perturbations, for example, if you're uh, if the animal uh, uh, has some uh, obstacle that's in front of them. But in addition, this system can learn. So it has the making of everything that we would need theoretically in order to, uh, in, in order to, uh, to, to take advantage of this automaticity in human subjects. Now here at the top, you see a list of different sources of sensory information, which now we know is very important. Over on the left, you see the, the cortex. We tend to think that most of our movement is controlled by the cortex, but my point here is most of this information uh, related to controlling movement comes relatively automatic as a result of the sensory information going to the spinal cord uh, and to, to the brain as well when, when there is no injury. Uh, the cortex certainly is an, is a, has an important influence and can, can control but it doesn't have to control, it can leave some of the control, and in fact a lot of the control, to automatic uh, mechanisms within this, largely within the spinal cord to control movement. So s the other uh, factor that I'd like to show, the basis of the concept of spinal learning. When animal, when if, if uh, uh, the animal is completely spinalized, the spinal cord is cut at a mid-thoracic region, and then if you train the animal to step, uh, what they will do over a period of weeks is learn to step better and better, more accurately, better coordinated stepping. So you see the top line is, is how fast the animals can step uh, when they have been trained to step. And then the uh, lower line represents those animals that have been spinalized, been treated the same, but they have not been trained to step. So this is one of the first indications that the spinal cord can learn. Carrying further with this, can you teach them to stand? Yes, we can teach them to stand, and over a period of weeks, they can learn to stand for a longer period of time uh, without uh, uh, falling down 
and uh, losing their ability to, to, to support. So we know that we, uh, the, the, we, if we can engage these circuits, uh, the circuits that are engaged can learn, and it basically learns what we teach it. Now, this is another example of learning, and when someone is practicing a skill, a new skill, you become better and better at performing this skill. You see the top three lines are examples of the trajectory of, uh, of the pull of spinal rats uh, that are stepping on the treadmill, and you see there's quite a bit of noise. In the lower three uh, rows uh, in th with the pink background, you see animals, each of these animals have been trained to step. So you can see the accuracy and consistency of the step is greatly improved as a result of the training. And this tells you how important it is to engage the circuitry uh, so that it can relearn how to perform these tasks. This is another example of that. In the top, you see the EMG burst patterns uh, that are, are uh, somewhat effective in stepping, but not very effective. And then in the bottom, you see more uh, uh, well-organized burst of EMG, <coughs> and that's reflected in the graphs to the right, which show those graphs to the right show that flexor and extensor muscles uh, have a much higher incidence of co-contraction, where there's activation in both flexion and extension at the same time. But as these animals are trained, the incidence of this co-contraction co decreases considerably, and we think this is one of the, uh, the, the phenomenon that is, is typical of relearning. Now, let's go to the neuromodulation of the physiological state of the spinal networks. And in, uh, in this case, what you're seeing is an animal that has been trained to stand a uh, complete spinal uh, transaction and has not taken a step for three months. And you can see when put on the treadmill, unlike the rats, what you saw earlier, this animal cannot step at all. He's been trained only to stand. But if you give this animal strychnine, strychnine disinhibits the spinal circuitry, gets it more excitable. And now the sensory information going to the spinal cord enables this animal to step full weight bearing over a range of speeds. And this uh, has this change in the physiological state of this spinal cord has changed within 30 minutes. For three months, this, indiv this uh, individual cat has, not, has never taken a weight bearing step. So again, showing the importance of the physiological state uh, and the neuromodulation and engage in these circuits that have become relatively non-responsive. Again, now, let's go back to this slide where we can appreciate it a little more. Again, remember what we're trying to do to find out to what extent this level of automoticity with the not only central pattern generation but the sensory information is available. The sensory information going from coming from the hind limbs is being is, uh, is derived simply from the direction of the movement of the treadmill relative to, to the orientation of the body. So all of this sensory and proprioceptive information is con serving as a complete control system. Now, how is this happening? Obviously, uh, it has to be something uh, like this. If you look at the top, you see the F fault would be the sensory ensemble that's going to the motor neurons and the interneurons when the, the animal is stepping forward versus stepping sideways and stepping backwards. So each one of these ensembles of sensory information is sending unique information to the interneurons. And the interneurons are interpreting this, these complex sensory signals and then making a decision to, uh, to activate a given set of motor neurons and the given set of motor neurons that are active will define whether the animal is stepping forward, backward, or, or sideways. So obviously we like to know who these interneurons are, and we don't really know very much about these interneurons. We've been trying to find this out for more than four decades and made considerable progress, but still a long ways for understanding this concept. As the animal is moving from, uh, walking from one side to the other, for example, it will activate different combinations of interneurons 
and different combinations of hinder neurons will activate different combinations of motor neurons, and again, that's where you get the forward, backward, and sideward stepping. Now, the another concept related to this is that, that there's a couple of ways of looking at how the spinal cord is processing this information. One way you could say each a pixel on this photograph represents an important piece of information that is telling the spinal cord about that particular pixel, and that is a, a, a specific signal for the spinal cord to do something. But let me suggest to you, if you look at it this way, if you take all the sensory systems and put them together, what the spinal cord is really trying to do is grasp what the total picture is, the big picture. So if you have all of the information from all of the sensor systems that are coming from the hind limb, then the spinal cord can see exactly where it is and what it should be doing next. So it's the combination of all of this sensory information that's given a specific signal to the spinal cord as to what the current state is and what needs and what's most likely going to happen next. I often make the comment that in these spinal animals, uh, what is illustrated is the sensory information that's coming back to the spinal cord. Uh, if it's an uninjured uh, individual, the same sensory information is coming back, but it's just being nice to the brain to tell the brain that it already knows what it's going to do. Again, this built-in automaticity is something that uh, the big question is, to what degree is this automaticity built into the human nervous system? So at this point, over uh, decades of, of research, we're beginning to think that maybe it's time to try some of these things in, in uh, individuals with complete paralysis. So if we could start uh, this slide. Okay, so what was the point of that? The point was that this is really where our thinking was uh, ab about 15 years ago when we were first beginning to learn that individuals with spinal injuries could, could uh, learn to step on the treadmill, but those individuals where we'd had that success was primarily with individuals with severe but not complete injuries. Now this work was done in collaboration with Susan Harkema uh, when she was at UCLA, and this was the beginning of our effort to transfer our, our knowledge, try to transfer our knowledge from, from the animal experiments to, to the humans. Now, here is a, an example of uh, a response by an individual with a complete paralysis to the far left, and then to, to the far right is a normal uh, individual, completely in, intact. So what has happened, an individual stepping on the treadmill uh, and with the complete paralysis, of course, there's some assistance of the movement of the legs, as you saw in the previous video. But what you see is as the uh, more loading is placed on the legs when the individual is, is stepping, you'll see that the EMG activity is activated more. You see a very similar pattern in the normal individual. So this is another illustration of automoticity where just with the sensory information is telling the spinal cord how to modulate the activation of the muscles to perform the movement. So this is another example uh, that's telling us, look, there's maybe the nervous system that's controlling the movement uh, in, in humans is not that different uh, from from uh, the rat and the mouse and the cat. Obviously, uh, every 
all the some details are different in every animal but here uh, you can see that I if you stimulate the lumbosacral region of the spinal cord of a spinal rat you see these alternating uh, patterns of activity of multiple muscles flexors and extensors of the hind limbs and over on the right uh, this is a spinal cord injured subject that is uh, completely paralyzed and you can see a very similar pattern. So there's increasing information that there's a lot of common elements. So it, the, at this point, uh, we became confident enough to let's tr say, let's try this in, in human subjects. And this was a collaboration between colleagues at Caltech and uh, with Joel Burdick and with uh, Dr. Susan Harkema at University of Louisville at this point. And then, uh, and then our group at UCLA. So we Im implanted four subjects and uh, began to see to what extent we could recover some of these functions. Now, the way we did this is the, we used the present technology that's available to the same technology that's used for suppressing pain uh, in, the, uh, in the spinal cord. Many subjects w with spinal cord injury have a lot of pain. And so uh, we thought that uh, even though this device was designed to do something else and it didn't have all the properties we would like based on our animal experiments, we still thought it would be good enough so we could determine proof of principle. It could this possibly work in human subjects. And so in the middle you see a 16 electrode array that's, uh, that's uh, overlaying a couple of the vertebrae in the lumbar region and this, uh, the, this electrode array was implanted to cover most of the lumbosacral segments that's important in standing and stepping. And one of the first things that we learned is the individuals could learn to stand, just like the cats learned to stand. It took a little longer uh, uh, initially for these individuals to learn to stand, but they could learn to stand. Uh, the, this individual was standing in a, st in a standing frame, trained every five days a week for... Uh, for uh, uh, almost a year, and uh, when the stimulation is off, the person cannot stand at all. The person can stand uh, uh, with the stimulation on, and as you see to the bottom and to the right of the graph, the, the line that's in black, this is the amount of time that the individual could stand uh, completely independently without any help, and this is approximately 20, 20 minutes over the time uh, that uh, they learned, but it took a while for the spinal cord to relearn how to process the sensor information. Now, in the next three slides, you're going to see uh, 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 several things. Uh, you're going to see an individual that has regained voluntary control uh, that had been previously paralyzed. When you turn the stimulator on the individual, we ask the individual to oscillate the legs, continuously flex the legs, uh, in multiple times, and you'll see in the first video uh, approximately 30 contractions, and then the individual breaks the cable, but then continues to contract, and you can see, again, the burst in EMG that continues for up to approximately 60 contractions. So this is demonstrating the return of voluntary control. The somehow the brain has reorganized and the, the uh, lumbosacral uh, circuitry has reorganized so that the two can talk to each other somehow. So now the uh, individuals have regained significant voluntary control. In the next, uh, in the following panel, the third panel that you're going to see is an individual that's not only learned to stand, but you'll see has learned to, to uh, gain some ability to balance. So the, the spinal cord also automatically uh, uh, modifies the physiological state of these circuits so that you can maintain your uh, posture uh, without falling. And so this is shown uh, in, in this video. So if you could show these three video clips.
So without this ability to have some balance, to be able to uh, throw the ball and catch it, uh, uh, the person would, would uh, fall uh, if they didn't have some degree of balance. But obviously it's not completely, uh, completely normal. Now, going back to the oscillatory activity, this is to show the enabling concept. And the blue uh, line there represents the 30 hertz signal, a continuous tonic signal that's being applied to the lumbosacral spinal cord through this electrode array. But the burst of activity just above that is what is generated from the, the, uh, the subject's intent to contract. So he, this, that's the voluntary aspect of it. So you only get the movement uh, when he intends to move. So this is, uh, the spinal cord is being stimulated to enable it to respond to the voluntary control that's coming from the brain and the reorganization of the spinal circuitry that has occurred that's also helped it to uh, enable this movement. So you can, uh, you can see that, at, uh, that this will, you see the contractions will occur on the bottom, you'll see the relative forces that are uh, generated uh, within a motor pool and you'll only see the movement when the uh, burst of EMG activity is generated voluntarily by the subject. Now, uh, in further looking into this, how they regain voluntary control, there's a th motor threshold that uh, I've mentioned before and I will talk more about later. But here you show in a, see in a graph uh, that at approximately seven volts, when the stimulation got up to a seven volts, the individual was able to regain voluntary movement. In the first subject that was implanted, this did not occur until uh, six to seven months after the implant. But in the subsequent subjects, given that we knew this was possible now, other subjects, and we became a little bit smarter in doing these experiments and learning how to stimulate, these subjects regain voluntary control much faster. So the point here is that once you get, get the threshold, you increase the voltage, you can get further, uh, more and more force, but you get to a point where if you stimulate too much, the stimulation interferes and overcomes the control system. So you have to have a modulation that's getting the excitability level of these networks within a relatively narrow window. It has to be above a threshold, but it can't be too much. So that's what we're trying to attain in all these subjects when they're being trained. Conceptually, it looks like this. To the left is an individual that would be uninjured, and you see that there is no problem getting above the motor threshold, the hash line. If the individual is injured, you can't get to that hash line. If you're below that hash line, you're completely paralyzed. You don't know how completely you are paralyzed, actually. You don't know how close you are to that hash line. But we do know if we stimulate, we can provide this background excitation, and then the person can have enough residual activity, it appears, to get above the threshold. Once you get above the threshold, you've engaged circuitry that has not been active before, and this circuitry can begin to reorganize and improve function with uh, continued practice. So another uh, way of looking at this, if you have a little bit of input uh, going to the motor neuron, it's still not enough to get to the threshold. You get another source of input, it's not. But if you can get a total amount of input is enough to get above this threshold, then you have go gone from being para completely paralyzed to not being completely paralyzed. Now here's a, 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 basically an, uh, a, a basic experiment that was done in, in rats where in the, uh, the rats were stimulated at a rate that was below the motor threshold, 20% below the motor threshold. So it in itself did not have any impact on the activity. On the left, on the two columns to the left, you'll see activity in one of the muscles, the soleus muscle, when the rat is just resting and in the cage. Over on the right, we turn the stimulator on and you still don't see much activity. But the point is, when they are playing around in the cage with the 20% less than motor threshold, you get an amazing amount of activity and, and performance of standing and quadrupedal stepping and so forth. And then uh, the total amount of activity when the uh, spinal cord is being stimulated is five times greater 
than it is if the, if the animal is not being stimulated below this threshold. So we think this has Im very important implications as to how we may be able to use this new modulation, not only in the clinic, but in the home. So basically what the stimulation is doing, uh, an analogy might be, it's just it's serving as a hearing aid. It's amplifying the, the potential of the sensory information that's going back to the spinal cord. Another way of looking at this is that you have a, a normal baseline level potential that's below the motor threshold. And then uh, to activate and get forces, you have to activate these motor neurons. And to do that, there's no problem if you're uninjured to get to that motor threshold and you can activate a given set of motor neurons. Now, uh, after an injury, we think that that baseline activity goes way down and as a result, with the same amount of input, it still would not be able, uh, you would not be able to reach uh, the, the motor uh, threshold. So, uh, so again, with the oscillatory activity, uh, you can easily get across the uh, threshold if you're uninjured, uh, but if you're uh, injured, uh, the threshold goes down with the same amount of input, uh, you will uh, still not be able to uh, reach the, uh, the threshold and therefore you completely paralyze. And then, uh, but if, if you can elevate uh, with the uh, electrical enabling motor control as we refer to, again, you've transformed from paralysis to one of incomplete paralysis. And then the same thing, I'll go quickly over this, is if you, if you look at a step cycle, the proprioceptive information is driving the system flexion and extension uh, uh, quite readily, uh, but after an injury, uh, the threshold uh, is further away uh, from what the baseline is and you cannot do anything, but with the stimulation, again, now we can enable this uh, proprioception to drive the flexion and, and extension. So another way of looking at driving this concept home uh, pretty hard here is that what we have to do is modulate the excitability of these interneurons. The motor pools are just doing what they're told by the interneurons. And so you have a, a background level of activity that's going to the motor neurons and then you uh, can add uh, stimulation uh, <coughs> and um, pharmacological activation and that's enough to get over this motor threshold using a combination of ways to modulate the excitability. Now I'm going to, there's an, another technique that we've developed in the meantime we re referred to as a transcutaneous stimulation. Rather than relying on an implant, we can take electrodes and just place on the skin over the uh, lumbosacral area or the cervical area and can uh, get similar responses as what's been seen in epidural electrodes. These five subjects that were studied, all of them had complete paralysis, motor complete paralysis. Some had some evidence of sensory information and would be considered an Asia B. Now, we placed these subjects that have been paralyzed for more than a year uh, with their legs extended over the table so they can oscillate. We're seeing if they can oscillate in a rhythmic pattern. And then here you'll see uh, uh, in, in this uh, series of, of movements, you'll see in the first time the individual is being treated with this transcutaneous stimulation, voluntarily you'll see virtually no movement. You'll see some wiggling of the leg, but it's basically with the subject moving their upper body and translating this momentum to the lower leg. But then when you ask the person to generate voluntary uh, movement in the presence of stimulation, uh, uh, you will see first the stimulation effect, voluntary, then stimulation, and then voluntary plus stimulation. And you will see that with voluntary plus stimulation in the first session, there's some evidence of voluntary contact. And this voluntary contact from the brain to the spinal cord. And this is after more than a year of complete paralysis. So start the video. Now th the individuals were trained for 18 sessions and you'll see before and after training.
So what you saw is a, a significant increase in the movement of the limbs. And what you see in this particular graph is the range of motion uh, in the knee that was recorded under these different conditions. In the first session on the far left, you see that even in that first session, when you combine voluntary activity plus stimulation, you see there's some influence of the voluntary. And then after four sessions, you see even more. But on the fifth session, what you see uh, that's really encouraging is that with voluntary activity alone, with voluntary influence alone, uh, the amount of movement that they could generate is not significantly different from that that's uh, combined with stimulation. So this tells us that there must have been significant reorganization of both the supraspinal and spinal networks that's allowing this to happen. So, uh, and this occurred with tr uh, approximately one hour treatment once a week for 18 weeks. So uh, again, we don't know how much further we can take this and we're obviously uh, 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 using similar techniques for to uh, and have results that the transcutaneous stimulation is also effective in facilitating standing uh, and, and to some degree stepping uh, and other secondary effects that we will talk about uh, later. But another experiment that we did we think is, is eventually going to be uh, more and more important with time as the technology improves in exoskeleton devices. Here we've combined stimulation with the exoskeleton and we, our first subject that we have tested and studied fairly extensively is that this individual had already practiced and knew how to work in this exoskeleton very well. So it's basically at a baseline. So when we added the stimulation, we, could, we would know what in additional, uh, the additional uh, functions that, that might emerge as a result of the stimulation plus stepping in the exoskeleton. And those results also are highly encouraging. So here's, a, here's an example of what the uh, individual looks like when they're stepping. Uh, you can't really tell when the stimulator is on and when it's not, but this is just to give you an indication of what it looks like when an, a completely paralyzed individual is stepping in the treadmill. And this is after he had had uh, 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 a number of treatments. I don't recall exactly the number here, but he could already walk uh, before we ever started to study him. But the real question is that we want to answer is to what degree uh, can he recover voluntary control and have some impact on the robotic device so it can perform some of the work and the robotic device does not have to perform all of the work. Okay, so start the video. Now in the next video, you're going to see our first test of whether he had regained voluntary control of flexing the legs, similar to what you saw in a previous subject with epidural stimulation. Again, this is with transcutaneous stimulation. And what you're going to see first, the subject is asked to flex the knee and uh, without the stimulator on, and uh, he will not be able to turn the stimulator on and he still is not moving the leg. But if you turn the stimulator on and then give him the signal to try to move the leg, uh, he tries to flex and you will see what happens. Uh, so, uh, so this individual had been trained for five sessions, had been paralyzed for more than four years when this experiment was done. So show the video.
So you can only imagine what it might feel like to an individual paralyzed for four years, and this is the first time they've been able to move. Of course, we don't know how much improvement can occur in terms of voluntary control, but again, this is transcutaneous stimulation uh, combined with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, working in this exoskeleton, and other uh, very interesting uh, results were found uh, with respect to the ability to, uh, uh, to modulate cardiovascular function. The heart rate could go up much uh, higher to a normal level. Uh, sweating would uh, occur, uh, and, and so there's a range of activities that are occurring rel relatively quickly as a result of the transcutaneous stimulation and the activity-dependent plasticity that's occurring. So the obvious question also is, can we neuromodulate the cervical spinal cord? Those individuals that are quadriplegic and could uh, uh, benefit from just a, a little bit of improvement. For example, this is to slide is to illustrate that just a little bit of work on the x-axis can result in marked changes in performance uh, when you have nothing to work with to begin with, as opposed to an athlete that's highly skilled uh, it takes a lot more work to get a relatively small amount. So my point is, is that even though to the uninjured, some of these changes may appear to be relatively small, they're highly significant to individuals that have no function. And they're as significant for the caregivers as they are for, for the subject. So here is an example of uh, uh, changes in the ability to generate forces with the hand grip uh, uh, before and after uh, four weeks of, of uh, approximately one to one and a half hours of treatment uh, twice a week. Play the video, please. So what you saw is uh, within those 15 sessions of, of treatment, uh, the amount of force that was gained uh, is uh, somewhere between five and tenfold. And these relatively, quote, small changes, uh, I can assure you that they're not small to the individual that's regaining this level of control. The first uh, amount of force that was generated was less than a half of a newton, and uh, then go into uh, almost uh, uh, almost uh, 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 two or three newtons of force. Now we're now trying to associate this with other quality of life functions and making some progress on this, which is encouraging, uh, which I, uh, an, an example of that is in, in this. This is a, an, another more recent subject that's been treated similar with transcutaneous stimulation. And this is just a demonstration of one task. There's multiple tasks like this that we are, are observing now. Start the video uh, that you'll see uh, that uh, this level of function cervical region is affecting more than those muscles that are just associated with grip. They're also affecting the uh, more proximal muscles, which, a which enables the person to move uh, the, the limbs in a more controlled way so they can add the control of the proximal muscles to the distal muscles and get even more function. But in addition, 
uh, almost all of the subjects are sh showing significant improvement in trunk control. So there's multiple physiological systems that are responding. So, uh, now let me try to give you some idea of the scope of what is, uh, we see before us. Number one, uh, we think that there's different pathologies that, that can uh, benefit uh, from these types of interventions and we're trying those and have some data uh, related to these first four items on, th on the left. But in addition, uh, this effect is even amplified more when you think of multiple functions that can be affected by this modulation. And then uh, when you think about the possibility of taking some of these interventions and combining them with other interventions that are being developed, uh, it uh, provides uh, uh, some reason to have some encouragement that we can really take this much further than we have been able to so far. So uh, we would have to uh, be fairly uh, optimistic at this point. I think at this point we certainly can say uh, reclaiming a highly functional life after paralysis is uh, well within our, quote, grasp. And uh, I think these things will translate into greater quality of life. Uh, we are just at the beginning of understanding these new phenomena that have been uncovered. And so the challenge is going to be to see to how, how far we can take these uh, interventions with respect to how far a given individual can improve and what kind of injuries are going to be uh, responsive to these types of interventions. So the evolution of the underlying concepts that I've talked about, the automaticity of movement uh, based on the uh, brain stem stimulation, the central pattern generation, sensory processing, the modulation of the physiological state, so, uh, so the, uh, in that gives us the enabling levels of neuromodulation, and this can be done uh, through electrical stimulation and pharmacological stimulation, and the all-important plasticity that's occurring as a result of the learning, the activity-dependent plasticity. So, uh, and we, we need to be able to combine uh, these new physiological uh, phenomenon and concepts with the technology. There needs to be a very tight integration of development of new technologies that can also help us to take advantage of uh, uh, new uh, functions uh, that we have not seen before uh, within the uh, brain and the spinal cord after, after injury. So I think we can easily say that uh, the previously unrecognized potential level of recovery of motor function via neuromodulation and neuroplasticity is highly significant. And I think we can look ahead uh, to further explore these possibilities. And I think we haven't come close to realize in the real clinical potential that's, as, that's before us. So many individuals have been imported uh, in, uh, in, in developing these experiments over a period of years. The individuals here have been key uh, 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 from almost the uh, beginning uh, from the technological standpoint and from the physiological standpoint. Down at the bottom, you have Joel Burdick from Caltech and then you have uh, Ruslan Gorodnichev from, from Russia, and you have Wen Tai Lu from UCLA. The top three uh, there are from UCLA, Roland Roy, Yuri Gerasimiko, and Parag Gad. And then uh, we have uh, multiple uh, scientists in, in the lab that have also contributed to these over years. And I talked uh, uh, quite a bit about the work that we've done in collaboration with Susan Harkema over in the far right, and uh, Claudia Angela, and our own uh, lab manager, uh, uh, Mandy uh, Turner. So we've been supported by uh, a number of organizations. Of course, we never get enough funding, and uh, we think with more funding we can go even faster, and we hope we'll be able to do that. Uh, thank you for uh, listening, and uh, I'm open to uh, answering questions. Some questions have been uh, submitted, uh, and uh, I can get to those questions, and and answer those uh, at this time. Thank you.
Okay, uh, let me, uh, I'll read the questions that have been submitted and, uh, and I'll give uh, a brief answer. What are the effects of spinal stimulation on bladder and bowel function? Uh, I didn't have a chance to talk about bowel and bladder function and other autonomic controls, but with both epidural stimulation and transcutaneous stimulation, we're consistently finding uh, in improvement in function of bladder and bowel function uh, to the extent that the individuals, some of the individuals uh, regain the ability to sense how, how uh, filled their bladder is and that is a very important uh, a point uh, to avoid overfilling of the, of the bladder. But not only can they sense it, but some of them have regained the ability to voluntarily void uh, urine. Uh, with respect to bowel, we've had reported cases of the, the, uh, the ease which, which uh, the, the subject has with taking care of the uh, bowel function on a daily basis is improved, saving time, can be done more quickly. Uh, so we have a number of uh, observations uh, consistent enough to convince us that uh, as we learn how to control this circuitry, this autonomic circuitry, uh, we will be able to take advantage of that automaticity as well. But the, the degree to which we can do that uh, remains to be determined, but there's a lot of interest and a lot of labs that are trying to make some progress on this because everyone knows how important this is in the daily life of those individuals with paralysis. A second question is, can the spinal stimulation device be used at home or in the clinic only? Presently, the epidural stimulation device has been used in the clinic, but we got approval with FDA that the subjects can take it home uh, with very specific uh, uh, limitations as to how much they can stimulate and what patterns of stimulation. So yes, that is happening. And yes, that is a very important question. Uh, the idea of, of uh, trying to, uh, and actually reaching a higher level of function, and then at the end of the study having to tell the subject, okay, uh, this is the end of the study, but we don't have a device that you can take home. Obviously, we have to avoid that. For the transcutaneous stimulation, we're in the process of, of building the device and trying to get FDA approval for this device. The intent is as rapidly as possible and hopefully as soon as it might be available uh, uh, for uh, distribution in clinics and use in the clinics, we hope that we will have the capability of uh, having a de a de and develop a device that will be able to go home. This is essential. Uh, for, for this to be uh, a prat practical type of intervention. So certainly that's going to be our goal and I think it's feasible. What will the spinal stimulation units cost? There's a big difference in the implantable system and the transcutaneous system. The, uh, the implantable system, when you, by the time you combine all the hospital costs, uh, you're uh, maybe even in the range of $150,000 just to get through the implant. Uh, and, and, and to buy the device. Uh, with the transcutaneous stimulation, we don't know how much that device will cost, but it may be somewhere uh, uh, initially uh, around ten to $20,000, but uh, with the possibility that that could come down substantially depending on uh, uh, many factors uh, in the, uh, from the commercial standpoint. And uh, when will these devices be available to patients? Well, the, the device, uh, one device uh, that's designed for pain is already available uh, if you get approval from FDA to use it accordingly. Uh, there are uh, a number of places that are trying to develop m smarter stimulators for epidural stimulation, and our lab is one of those individuals, individual labs that's doing so. Uh, and uh, our track uh, 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 plan is to be able to have a device that we think will be far superior to what's presently avail available, uh, but it's going to take five to six years and uh, a lot more money uh, to get that to the point where it would be commercially uh, available. We think, on the other hand, with the transcutaneous stimulation, that that device, uh, with uh, a, a acquiring uh, adequate support, uh, this device can be available within two to two and a half years and we're obviously looking forward to that day. 
Uh, what other uh, benefits uh, do you expect from spinal stimulation? Would the therapy help reduce medical costs? We certainly think it's going to reduce medical costs because it has these multiple secondary effects you might call secondary, but the very important effects related to autonomic function. Uh, we think that the, the, the data in the end, we don't have these data now, but we want to get these data as rapidly as possible. We think the data are going to show that by the time you consider all the cost of the intervention itself, that's going to be far cheaper uh, than uh, not having this intervention because of the medical complications without having it. Uh, those medical complications, the cost of that over a period of lifetime is going to be far greater than the initial cost of, of the intervention. That is our, uh, what we are thinking at the time. We don't have the evidence to show that, but that is uh, some evidence that we need to get. Can the same device be used for hand rehabilitation and leg rehabilitation? Well, not quite because you, the, the, the functions that you use with your hand and, and with your legs will, will be different. But both of them are basically the same time, same frame, framework in that uh, we are trying to take advantage of the activity-dependent plasticity. So we've got to get this, the, uh, the cervical spinal networks that are involved in a given movement. We have to have the apparatus that's going to, to uh, enable that movement to occur. But we also want those devices to have feedback uh, to the subject so they will know how they're performing. So there's lots of room for improvement in specialized devices, and I think that's going to be part of the, uh, the new uh, uh, thinking uh, of how to fully take advantage of these types of um, interventions. So anyway, I think I'll stop there, and thank you very much for your attention. And I uh, hope you uh, enjoy uh, this special uh, virtual symposium uh, in neuroscience. Thank you.